Hello and welcome to the Mercury Project. Mercury Atlas 7. The Mercury Atlas 7, launched May 24, 1962, was the fourth flight of the Mercury Project, the first manned space program of the United States. The Mercury spacecraft, named Aurora 7, made three Earth orbits, piloted by astronaut Scott Carpenter. He was the sixth human and fourth American in space. A targeting error during re-entry took the spacecraft 250 miles off course, delaying the recovery of Carpenter and the spacecraft. The mission used Mercury spacecraft number 18 and Atlas launch vehicle number 107D. Mission Highlights Preparation Mercury spacecraft number 18 was delivered to Cape Canaveral, Florida on November 15, 1961. While under checkout, the crew changed the periscope and also worked on the drogue parachute to prevent it from firing prematurely as it had during the previous flight. In addition, a device known as a 446, or low-level communicator, was added to measure the temperature around the capsule recording temperature data from 28 positions on the spacecraft. The Atlas Vehicle 107D was rolled out of the Convair factory in San Diego, California on February 25, 1962. It was delivered to Cape Canaveral on March 6, 1962. Atlas 107D incorporated two small changes from the 109D, specifically removal of an insulation blanket from the common propellant tank bulkhead that was deemed unnecessary and booster jettison changed to one second earlier. The temperature sensor insulation and correction of the drogue parachute circuit delayed the launch until May. A network of ground station and ships called the Mercury Network was arranged around the globe to provide continuous coverage of the spacecraft. On Mercury Atlas 7, the network consisted of 15 Mercury sites supplemented by several Atlantic missile range stations and the Goddard Space Flight Center. Scientific Experiments The focus of Carpenter's five-hour mission was on science. The full flight plan included the first study of liquids and weightlessness, earth photography, and an unsuccessful attempt to observe a flare fired from the ground. One of the experiments would include the releasing of a multicolored balloon that would remain tethered to the capsule. Observing the behavior of liquid in a weightless state inside a closed glass bottle, using a special light meter to determine the visibility of a ground flare, making weather photographs with handheld cameras, and studying the air glow layer, for which Carpenter would receive special training. The tethered balloon was a 30-inch mylar inflatable sphere, which was folded, packaged, and housed with its glass expansion bottle in the antenna canister. The whole balloon package weighed two pounds, divided into five sections of different colors. Uncolored, aluminum, yellow, orange, white, and phosphorescent coatings that appeared white by day and blue by night. The balloon was cast off near the perigree after the first orbital pass to float freely at the end of a 100-foot nylon line. The purpose of the balloon experiments were to study the effects of space on the reflection properties of colored surfaces through visual observation and photographic studies to obtain aerodynamic drag measures by use of a strain gauge. During flight, Carpenter was awakened at 1.15 a.m. on the morning of the flight and ate a breakfast of orange juice, filet mignon, eggs, toast, and coffee. Prior to insertion in the capsule, he was administered a hydration regimen of water, juice, coffee, and sweet tea. He ascended to the gantry at 436 and entered the spacecraft at 443. Unlike Mercury Atlas 6, there was no problem with the sealing bolts. Launch occurred at 745 a.m. Florida time on May 24, 1962. Launch vehicle performance was overall excellent with one small anomaly in one of the sustainer engine's hydraulic switches that moved to abort the position at T plus 265 seconds. Because a faulty pressure transducer produced an erroneous reading indicating the loss of hydraulic pressure. However, since another transducer indicated correct position levels until after sustainer engine cutoff, the launch proceeded normally. The Atlas flight path was so accurate that Aurora 7 reached almost the exact orbital parameters planned for the mission. Carpenter had solid food items for the first time in the form of freeze-dried cubes in a plastic bag. 
instead of paste squeezed out of a tube, which produced problems with loose crumbs floating around inside the cabin. The food cubes had been coated with an anti-crumbling agent. However, they may have been accidentally crushed prior to the launch, breaking the coating. Carpenter expressed concern about the crumbs being sucked into the ventilation intakes in the capsule. In addition, a candy bar included in the food supply melted from the high cabin temperatures up to 102 degrees. By the end of the second orbit, he informed Mercury Control that most of the food was a mess and he would have to avoid touching it for the rest of the flight, aside from taking a Xylos capsule. With each orbit sunrise, Carpenter also saw the fireflies. He saw the particles more like snowflakes than fireflies. He also noted that the particles did not seem to be truly luminous and varied in size, brightness, and color. Some were gray, some were white, and one in particular, said Carpenter, looked like a shaving from a lathe. Although they seemed to travel at different speeds, they did not move out and away from the spacecraft as the confetti had in the balloon experiment. The Carpenter also took 19 photos of the flattened sun at orbit sunrise. At dawn of the third and final orbit, Carpenter inadvertently bumped his hand against the inside wall of the cabin and solved a mystery from the previous flight. The resulting bright shower of particles outside the spacecraft, what John Glenn had called fireflies, turned out to be ice particles shaken loose from the spacecraft's exterior. Near the end of the flight, Carpenter found that by banging his hand against the wall of the capsule, he could shake loose more fireflies. At first, it was thought that the particles could be marker dye or shark repellent, both green in color. However, testing confirmed that neither of those were likely to escape from their packages at zero gravity. It was suspected that the fireflies were either streams from the life support system turning into snow when exposed to open space, or debris on the exterior of the spacecraft being shaken loose. However, the former was considered the more plausible explanation. Steam gathered by the life support system formed condensation between the spacecraft bulkhead and the heat shield, which then escaped into space and froze. Like Glenn, Carpenter circled the Earth three times. Total weightlessness, 4 hours, 39 minutes, 32 seconds. The performance of the Mercury spacecraft and Atlas launch vehicle was excellent in nearly every respect. All primary mission objectives were achieved. The single mission critical malfunction which occurred involved a failure in the spacecraft's pitch horizon scanner a component of the automatic control system. This anomaly was adequately compensated for by the pilot in subsequent in-flight operations so that the success of the mission was not compromised. A modification of the spacecraft control system thruster units was effective. Cabin and pressure suit temperatures were high but not intolerable. Some uncertainties in the data telemetry from the bio-instrumentation prevailed at times during the flight. However, associated information was available which indicated continued well-being of the astronaut. Equipment was included in the spacecraft which provided valuable scientific information. Notably that regarding liquid behavior in weightless state, identification of air glow layer observed by astronaut Glenn, and photography of terrestrial features and meteorological phenomena. An experiment which was to provide atmospheric drag and color visibility data in space, though the development of an inflatable sphere was partially successful. The flight further qualified the Mercury spacecraft systems for manned orbital operations and provided evidence of extended duration and consequently more demanding system requirements. Landing Passing over Hawaii at the final orbit, Flight Director Kraft told Carpenter to begin his retrofire countdown and to shift from the manual control to the automatic altitude control, partly because he had been distracted watching the fireflies. Carpenter noted that he had begun his landing preparations late. As he started to align the spacecraft, he found the automatic stabilization system would not hold the required 34 degree pitch and 0 degree yaw altitude. While trying to determine the source of the trouble, he fell behind on his checks of other items. When he hurriedly switched to the fly-by-wire control mode, he forgot to switch off the manual control. As a result, both systems were used redundantly together for 10 minutes and fuel was wasted. 
In addition to the altitude failure, Carpenter also activated the retro rockets three seconds late, adding another 15 miles or so to the trajectory error. Due to the lack of fuel, Carpenter overshot his planned re-entry mark and splashed down 250 miles from the target. After several hours of frantic searching, Carpenter was located in the area northeast of Puerto Rico and taken on board the aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. Other than slight exhaustion, he was in good health and spirits, and post-flight medical exams did not find any significant physical changes or abnormalities. Kraft, however, was unhappy with the astronaut's performance due to his needlessly high expenditure of altitude control fuel, which resulted in re-entry and landing taking place well off course. And so, Carpenter was sidelined for future missions. He left the space program in 1964 to participate in the Navy's Sea Lab program. Aurora 7 is displayed at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you for watching the Mercury Project, Mercury Atlas 7. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.